this was back sometime in the late 1990s. My now wife, girlfriend at the time, and myself were on a cross-country road trip driving through the great American countryside. We were somewhere in New Mexico, if memory serves me correctly. It's here my wife needed to use the restroom. This was okay since we needed to fill the car up anyway as we were already running low on fumes. So the search for a place to stop began. My wife spots an advertisement for a Taco Bell and a Chevron station and thus we head on over. Now it was 2 in the morning so the already quiet and isolated desert was made worse with the sounds of silence and crickets. This made this experience that much more eerie, especially considering we're practically in the middle of nowhere. Anyway, we both step outside and I get to filling up our Toyota. Meanwhile, my wife heads inside to use the restroom. Fast forward a couple of minutes and my wife returns with snacks in hand. Now this is the part where I wish we could have just left, but seeing as I was in the mood for a hot dog, I head back in while my wife sits in the car and munches on some M&Ms. The worst mistake of my life. So I grab a hot dog and some soda and I just so happen to look outside while I'm paying the cashier. In the distance where our car is parked, I can see what looks like a man speaking to my wife. My wife was still in the car mind you. I found this odd and I kept on looking and then I can see him reaching for the passenger side door handle as he attempted to open it. I wasn't having that, so I quickly run out, leaving my hot dog and soda on the countertop. Hey, what in the world are you doing? Knock it off! The man turns around and he reveals that he was armed. It looks like a gun, a Beretta to be exact, or a similar model. I froze as he now demanded we give him all the money we had. The thing was, my wallet was in the car, and all I had with me were a few dollars in change. In the moments that seemed like they last forever, I tell him to let me step into the car so I could grab my wallet and then hand it over. It was risky, but it was worth a chance. He agrees and keeps an eye on me as I slowly and carefully inch my way to the driver's side. Meanwhile, my wife was crying like no tomorrow. Well, since the key was already in the ignition, all it took was me to press on the pedal and we could possibly avoid this altercation. And that's exactly what we do. I tell my wife to get down for cover, and when she does, I floor us out of there. The last thing I remember was both of us looking into the passenger side window, and the man just staring at us in confusion. We were out of the danger, but what about the cashier? As far as I know, the man never robbed the place as I called the local sheriff's office and mentioned the location. They told me there were no reports of any sort of robberies, so maybe he decided it was better off not to go after anyone. Needless to say, had things turned out differently, I might not be here to tell this story to you all. Looking back on this today, I can't help but wonder what might have happened had my girlfriend Stacy and I not been packing heat. To take you back, this was in the mid-90s, way before it was commonplace to see anyone with a cell phone. Nowadays, it's almost crazy to see someone without one. Honestly, the many things a cell phone can do for you. It's truly outstanding. Sure, you can communicate with family and friends, but you can also use it as a tool. GPS being one of the greatest advantages. Say you wanted to take a trip across the country. Well, no longer do you need MapQuest, or a physical map you might pick up at the dollar store. But I digress. Stacy and I were heading home from visiting my parents during the holiday season. We were in the middle of nowhere, rural Georgia, and we had about three hours left to get back home. I remember it had been raining heavily as flashes of lightning could be seen in the distance, and the rain hit the windshield like being in a busy car wash. Stacy sat fast asleep in the passenger seat, and I had my cup of coffee I'd purchased from a 7-Eleven, which was helping me keep awake. At about a quarter past midnight, I began to notice the left side of my vehicle sinking toward the ground. And my car wasn't exactly top-notch, thus it took a bit to realize my issues. We had a flat tire. 
So I go ahead and slowly come to a stop at the side of the road, and this causes my girlfriend to wake up. Hey babe, what's wrong? Why are we stopping? I catch her up on the flat tire situation and she starts to freak out. She's always been the paranoid type, and being stuck out here in the middle of nowhere at midnight during a rainstorm wasn't exactly helping her nerves. I reassure her I had seen a call box just a ways behind our parked vehicle, and this seems to calm her down. I will tell you one thing, however. Stepping out of your vehicle in the middle of nowhere, with the only light source coming from your car's headlights, is pretty creepy. I couldn't help but feel someone or something was going to pop out with an axe at any moment and then try to cut us into bit-sized pieces. Guess that's what happens when you watch too many scary movies. But luckily, I always had my little 38 special in the glove compartment, which ensured if anyone were trying to cause us any harm, they would have to get through that first. In any case, I walked approximately 30 seconds over to a call box as my girlfriend waited in the vehicle. If you've never used a call box before, it pretty much has four buttons. Blue is for accident, green is for major service such as a mechanical breakdown or a need to send a tow truck, black is for at a gas or flat tire, and then yellow is to cancel. I went ahead and pressed the green button, which ensured I would have someone come and help us out in no time. One of the key advantages to call boxes is that your location is pretty much immediately known. That's why I wasn't too worried about our current circumstance. Sure, here we were, abandoned in the middle of the night, but at least we had the certainty we would soon get help. I returned to the vehicle, completely drenched from the downpour, as I tried my best to warm up using our heater. Approximately six to seven minutes of seeing no vehicles, we noticed headlights in a rear view mirror. Now, the nearest town was approximately 30 minutes from our current location, so it was pretty possible that help was already going to arrive. As expected, it wasn't our help though. Instead, it was an old truck that drove past us. Not that I could really blame them for doing so, but you never know who you might be dealing with in the middle of nowhere. However, just as soon as they had appeared, they turned around and then drove to our vehicle before coming to a stop. A man, from what I could tell, was in his early 40s, with a large beard, beanie and overalls, comes over to our window and asks if we needed any sort of roadside assistance. I explained we had a flat tire and that we were actually currently waiting for a tow truck. Still, I thanked him for his concern and said he was free to leave if he wished. The man, caught off guard, looks over at my girlfriend and then asks what our relationship was. Not really sure why he needed to know, but I told him she was my girlfriend. This sudden grin now comes over his face, almost as if he was excited from this sudden information, but he quickly gains his composure before saying he would love to spend more time with the two of us if we let him into the back seat. For real, I wasn't even sure what that was supposed to mean. He says he was just trying to be friendly and wanted to ensure nobody was going to try to come up to her vehicle and try to rob us. I told him that wasn't really an issue, not mentioning the revolver yet, and this causes the man to get a bit frustrated. Come on, open the door, I don't bite, the man said jokingly as he reached for the back door handle and attempted to open it. It was locked, and this is the point I tell the man that he needs to leave. Frustrated he didn't get his way, the man makes his way back to his vehicle and we think he's about to leave. Maybe just some random dude trying to scare us, we thought, but then things got worse. Less than 10 seconds after getting into the driver's seat, he jumps out of his truck, but this time he's got backup. And by backup, I'm talking about a baseball bat. Surely he wasn't going to invite me to a game of baseball out here in the middle of nowhere. The man approaches our vehicle for a second time, and this time is more firm with his request. Let me in, otherwise I'm going to break the window, and you won't like what I do next. Stacy, on the verge of a meltdown, reaches into the glove compartment and then passes me over the 38 Special. All of a sudden, I see the man's eyes go wide and he drops the baseball bat in shock. Before I get a chance to say anything, he tells me that he was just playing around and he didn't really mean anything by his statements. I tell him to leave, and he does, but not before picking up his baseball bat and then returning to his vehicle. The man drives out of there, never to be seen, 
or heard from again. As for our help, a tow truck arrived no more than 15 minutes after our encounter with the strange man. We asked the driver if they had sent anyone earlier. Strange question considering the previous man had a regular truck, and he ensured Stacy and I he was the only one out here in this direction. Thankfully, nothing else happened other than being driven back to town, and we ended up renting a motel room and stayed the night. We made it back home the next afternoon. We still don't know whether or not that man was serious or why he even wanted to break into our vehicle, but was he really that desperate to keep us company? Most likely not. So friends, I will leave you with this tad bit of information. Be very careful with who you interact with, especially when you're out in the middle of nowhere. Come prepared and expect the unexpected. This happened last year, and my girlfriend Tiana and I were camping in the Alabama wilderness. This was the only second time that we had gone camping, the previous occurrence saw staying near some campgrounds along with other families. This time we wanted more privacy since that camping trip was full of annoying kids. So we get into our RV camper one early August morning and made a road trip to drive about 25 miles from the city limits off the main road and into a forest. We stop next to a little pond and proceed to spend the rest of the day setting up a little tent as well as me teaching my girlfriend all about survival basics. At around 6.45pm we were busy cooking some steaks we had brought. My girlfriend was inside the RV using the restroom, meanwhile I was the one cooking. Out of nowhere I heard a deep man's voice say something from the tree line. I perked up and focused my attention to see a scruffy man with an axe who had this really confused look across his face. Hey, good evening sir. What'd you need? I asked him, putting my hand onto my waist where I have a concealed 9mm on my belt. Oh, nothing, just walking around. I saw some smoke. Anything you need? I told him we were fine and he gives me an indication as if saying he's about to leave. But then Tiana steps out of the RV and I see his expression change. It goes from meh, whatever, to ooh, what do we have here? Well, hello there, beautiful. How are you? Wait, are you two married? A quick tangent here. I proposed to Tiana just a few weeks later, and yeah, she said yes. Thank you for the compliment, sir. Yeah, we are. What about it? Oh, nothing really. You're a very lucky man. She's very beautiful. I said thank you before he finally takes off, but not before looking Tiana up and down. What was that all about? Who was he? Tiana asked me handing me a Bud Light and then taking a seat on her foldable chair. I don't know. He just popped out of nowhere and said he saw our campsite. Probably just some random backpacker. We forgot about him pretty quickly and moved on with our evening. At this point in the story, I would say unfortunately, but this next part did turn out to be a blessing in disguise in a way. Us not really focusing on the weather forecast, were caught off guard when we were hit with a sudden rain slash windstorm talk about a perfect evening being ruined. We were already out here, so it's not like we were really feeling like having to drive back home. Therefore, we chose to head into the RV and fell asleep watching some movies on my MacBook. I don't remember the exact time, but I want to estimate maybe 2 or 3 a.m. I began to hear what sounds like footsteps on puddles. The heavy rain had turned into a light sprinkle now, and I could still hear a little bit of the howl coming from the winds. I now focused my attention on the noises, and I could distinctly remember hearing somebody coughing. Now just imagine this for a brief moment. Imagine you're in the middle of the woods, and you hear what sounds like someone possibly stalking your campsite. Yes, I am armed, but that didn't explain the sudden chills I got. Deciding to take matters into my own hands, I grabbed my gun from the desk and then peeked out through the curtains. What I saw was very bizarre. Remember that man I talked to just a bit earlier in my story? The one who said he saw our campfire? Well, with the glow of the moonlight, I can just make him out, alongside another man, who looked almost identical to him, minus the beer belly. I continued to watch them and saw both of them take out some knives, as they then start to attack the wheels on the RV. I can't tell you how mad that made me, as I head toward the front door so I could chase them away. 
I feel the door handle begin to violently shake, however, as I put my hand onto it. It's at this point in the story, I didn't care if I woke up my girlfriend, since I wasn't trying to spook her. Using the most intimidating voice I could muster up, I tell the men, Whatever you two are planning, your best option is to leave. I have a gun, and I'm not afraid to take you two out. Just try me. Things went silent and the doorknob stopped shaking. I heard the men whispering, but I was unable to make out what was said. After what seemed like forever, I hear their footsteps grow distant, and I get visual confirmation of their departure by seeing them walk away from the window. A sense of relief now came over me, but that would be interrupted when I thought about the wheels. Surely, if they were slashed, we would be stuck out here and those two might come back armed with their own guns. My girlfriend, who was already awake, freaking out, tells me it was best that we leave now. I wasn't complaining. I hopped into the driver's seat and we drove for about roughly 15 minutes until we had to stop at the side of the road. This was where I would finally see the damage these guys had caused. Two flat tires. Thankfully, a quick call to a towing company saw me and my girlfriend being picked up and driven back into town. In case you're wondering, we did report the incident to the authorities, but as far as we know, they are still out there. I just finished listening to your video you did on Scary Gas Station Stories Creepy Fox, and it's a shame I didn't find it earlier. I have my own frightening tale that happened to myself and my father around 2003. I was 16 years old at the time. We were going to visit my grandmother who had suddenly fallen ill. She lived in North Dakota. Meanwhile, my father and I lived in South Dakota. A quick side note here. We were originally from North Dakota, but my father and I moved south due to him having a better job opportunity. But that's not really important to the story other than explaining where we were traveling from. In total, it would be about 8 hours to the hospital and it would see us driving on pretty lonely and quiet highways. I just picked up Pokemon Sapphire a couple of days before the road trip and I was busy leveling up my team as my father took care of the driving. Along the way, we made a couple of stops. First stop at a Wendy's to pick up a couple of hamburgers and french fries. I'm not sure if it's just me, but anyone else agree that fast food on a road trip is just more delicious than when you're picking it up at your local store? I don't know, maybe it's just me. I digress. When we were about two hours from the hospital, we'd stopped at a rest area that had a gas station since we needed to use the restroom. I went in first since this was a one-person restroom. And once I'm done, my father heads inside. Meanwhile, I pick out some Cheetos and a couple of sodas for my dad and I to enjoy on the final track of the trip. I do recall this little shop having these strange little knickknacks that could give anyone a run for their money. My dad, as per usual, was taking away longer than expected in the restroom. That's why I told him I would wait in the car since it was a pretty chill 65 degrees outside and I wanted to get back to playing Pokemon. Once in the passenger seat, I turned on my Game Boy Advance and continued battling and capturing Pokemon. I must have lost track of time, because I was so focused on this screen that when I heard knocking on the window, I was startled and actually let out a sudden gasp. Expecting to see my father, I was left pondering when standing at the passenger door is a random man. Now, I've never been the best with details, so I'll just describe him to the best of my ability. He wore a hoodie with the hood over his face. He had baggy blue jeans, and I could see a scruffy beard and long hair falling over his chest. I gave him an awkward wave and hello as I looked over to see if the doors were locked. They were, and a small breath of relief comes over me. Hey kid, you have any money on you? I can hear him through the glass window. I told him I had none expecting him to leave and go ask somebody else, but instead he's still standing there, menacingly. About 10 seconds of this awkward staring, he reaches for the door handle and starts to violently shake it. Come on, Dad, where the heck are you? I started screaming in my mind. When out from nowhere, he takes out a revolver. Panic is now ensuing, and I can feel my heart begin to beat out of my chest. If you don't have any money, then I'll take the car instead. Now get out, kid. I don't want to hurt you. I sat there for what felt like an eternity thinking this had to be some really bad prank. Please, just let it be so. 
The man shouted at me again, this time expressing even more frustration. I was so terrified thinking that he was going to shoot the glass and then shoot me, which is why I did as he said and got out of the car, but on the driver's side. I was just hoping it would take the vehicle and leave, so I dropped my Game Boy Advance, crawl over to the driver's seat, and then book it. My father was just stepping out of the convenience store, and I yelled to him that there was a man trying to take our car. My father, bless his heart, being a former Marine who actually conceal carries, runs over to our vehicle and then takes out his own gun, demanding the man to get out. The man who had placed the revolver on the driver's seat, that detail was later explained to me by my father, had no time to react and to grab his gun. So the man puts his hands up and steps out of the vehicle. Seconds later, the man makes a run for it and heads across the highway. I was already inside the gas station, by the way, telling the clerk to call the authorities as we didn't have a cell phone. Police officers got to the location roughly 20 minutes later and the police officers took our statement as well as beginning a search. We left a short time after that and made it to the hospital in one piece. Thank God my grandma made a full recovery and went on to live a happy life until her passing in late 2013. To this day, some 15 years later, we aren't sure whether or not that man was even caught or arrested. I'm sure they were able to look up the serial number on the revolver and most likely matched it with the owner. But again, I don't know. It remains lost to time. Sorry that my story isn't going to be like a novel and be super descriptive or long. Since this happened quite some time ago, many of the details are pretty fuzzy, but I'm going to do my best of my ability to include as much information as I can. I was on a road trip visiting my uncle from Pennsylvania, and I made a stop in Kansas, the town I took a break at. I can't remember the name since this was in the late 1980s, had a motel that seemed pretty cheap, but very affordable. I ended up leaving that motel a few hours later because the people in the room beside me were fighting and making a huge ruckus. I do recall being given a refund and an apology, to which I said that's alright, I'm leaving anyway, and drove to a rest area. It was empty and looked like it would be the perfect spot to catch some Z's. That wasn't the only thing I caught, however. A bad case of the creeps. As I was dreaming about food or whatever it was my young self dreamed of, I was snapped awake when I hear scratching against my Volkswagen Type 2's doors. I had some makeshift curtains I'd take on and off, so I couldn't actually see what, or I guess better yet, who was causing this disturbance. I finally got the courage to peek through my curtains, and I see this dude without a t-shirt trying to open my door. I should let you know that this was in late October, and it was easily mid-50s outside. The dude had to have been cold. I opened my window ever so slightly and asked him what the big deal was. He looked at me with glazed eyes, then asks if I could let him in. I would have, if it didn't seem that the dude has a knife. I guess I could have told him to drop the knife, and maybe then I would consider letting him in to spend the night in my vehicle. But I'm not a crazy dumb person. I wasn't going to let him in. I tell the guy to get lost, and he now grows upset. He uses the handle end of the blade, and then starts hitting my windows. Forget the cracks that formed. I was more concerned this guy wasn't all there in the head, and if he managed to get in, after his sudden angry outburst, all I had to defend myself with was a boogie board I was going to use when my uncle and I went to California. I didn't even have to wait for him to break in, however. I just crawled over to the driver's seat and I drove out of that parking lot, leaving the guy behind in the dust, quite literally. I drove for about half an hour until I reached the next town and then assessed the damage that had taken place. There were scratches on my doors and cracks on the windows as well. I was pretty angry, but thankfully at the same time he didn't manage to get in as I had slept. Thank God that even today I am a light sleeper and I wake up to almost anything because you never know if there might be somebody trying to break in and trying to get to you. Back when I was in college, around 7 years ago, I used to make it a tradition to go back home and visit my family at least twice a month. Just so you know, this takes place in Alaska. 
Now the reason I did this was because it would allow me to catch up with them as well as attend my little brother's baseball games. I was his older brother so I felt it was my duty to go and cheer him on. Not important to the story but they ended up winning a couple of state championships. Way to go little brother. Anyway it was a Thursday night in August, I'd say around 9pm and I was making the same routine drive heading back home. Everything was fine until my car started to slow down. Eventually it comes to a stop and I realized that it was the battery. Well great, I was stuck, so time to use my phone. There was only one problem with that. I had no cell phone reception whatsoever. So what to do? Obviously the only thing I could do was wait for help. Sadly this road I take hardly sees any traffic so I knew I was in for quite the wait. 30 minutes go by, no one. An hour goes by, not a single sign of civilization. That's when I started to get impatient and started walking back the way I came from. Hopefully in the time I made it back to the city that I had seen about 2 miles ago, I'll see a car. What I do see however, was something a bit different. Out of seemingly nowhere, two bear cubs appear from the nearby woods and start to get closer. Don't get me wrong, they were really cute, but I knew this was bad. Mama bears are extremely protective of their cubs. If she saw me interacting with them, I was dinner and I was a goner. So I do what any smart person would do. Without breaking eye contact, I slowly start to back up. However, these bear cubs were very curious and begin to follow me. And to make things worse, the mom appears from the forest. This is where I thought she was going to charge at me and rip me into smithereens. Instead, she stares at me for a few seconds and then just like the kiddos, begins to follow me. I know what you're thinking. Run, you idiot. Joke's on you. Bears can run faster than humans. I stood no chance if I spooked them. Just when it seemed all hope was lost, I can see headlights in the distance. I was saved. The driver starts to flash their lights on and off and starts honking. This startles the bears and I think, oh great, thanks pal, you've startled them. They're going to attack me. Instead, the three of them now run into the forest. Saved, quite literally, by a stranger. The driver who turned out to be a father with his family is able to drive me to town where eventually I get reception and I do call for a towing company. That was pretty much it. That was the story of how I went on a road trip and almost became a bear's dinner. At least it made for a good story when I got home. When I turned 18 years old, my dad had bought me my first car. It was your typical girly vehicle. A light blue Volkswagen Beetle. I loved and adored that thing and I drove it anywhere I went. Whether it be to work, to visit friends, or even go on mini road trips, that car and I were together like peanut butter and jelly. Such was a time when I was going to visit my parents after I moved away for college. It's about a six hour trip south that sees me maneuvering some pretty quiet and desolate highways. It was peaceful and as the only thing I had to worry about was quenching my boredom with podcasts as well as new music, these adventures were something I always look forward to. Nothing out of the ordinary is really worth mentioning in the first few hours. The only thing I guess I could really give you is that about halfway through the drive, the sun had set and I had stopped at a Carl's Jr. to get myself a spicy chicken sandwich with some french fries. When I was about 30 minutes from my hometown, my bladder started to tell me that it was now time to stop and use the restroom. I opted to take a quick break at an AM PM that was part of a little shopping center. There was a subway, a Baskin Robbins, and a convenience store that sold snacks and souvenirs. I had to go in the little convenience store since for whatever reason this AM PM charged 25 cents and I didn't have any change. In order to get to the restrooms, I had to walk to the back of the store where all the drinks and alcohol are located. There were a couple of what I assumed were truck drivers standing by the beer talking amongst themselves. When they saw me walk past them, they stopped talking and started to whisper to each other. I already knew they were talking about me because I was able to hear the word girl. I walk into the restroom and then start to end up doing my business. But here's the creepy part. 
Since the sink is next to the door, I am able to hear movement of talking coming from the hallway. I for whatever reason started to listen as I'm washing my hands and I could hear the same voices of those truck drivers. What I hear them say was very eerie. This is what I can remember being said. It's not the exact wording so I'm just paraphrasing here. When she gets out, I'm going to grab her and lead her out the back door. You look out for any people. That's something I forgot to mention. There was a back entrance that led you to the parking lot. Hearing these whispers and these voices, I immediately went into fight or flight mode because by the sound of things, they wanted to kidnap me. I go ahead and play it smart now. I go into one of the stalls and by raising my voice, I call for the police using my cell phone while taking out my pepper spray. Hello, yes, I'm at this rest stop and there are these two men outside the restroom who are trying to kidnap me. I have some pepper spray, but could you send over some police officers? While the operator is talking to me, I can hear the two men curse something outside, and then their footsteps grow distant as I sit there waiting in the restroom. After about 20 minutes of waiting, two police officers finally show up and knock at the restroom door, telling me that it was now safe to step outside. I now gave them my story, and we spoke with the cashier, and he told us that he saw the two truck drivers run out of the store as if they were in some sort of rush. In summary, I ended up leaving a few minutes after the talk with the officers and I was able to make it back home without any further issues. I live in Southern California and every once in a while, myself and a couple of my buddies will go to the Harris Casino Resort located in San Diego, California. We always go with this mentality that we're going to walk out millionaires only to cry knowing we wasted hundreds of thousands of dollars. But I guess that's the appeal, being able to escape from the stress of work and dream for a little bit. Such was a trip to the casino we took in the summer of 2017. I just got an out of work and drove over to my friend Brian's house. He would be the designated driver. Once I met up with Brian, we drive over to a friend Philip's house. We then begin the approximate two hour drive to the casino. The first hour and a half is pretty nice. You're driving down your typical Southern Californian freeway. The last 30 to 45 minutes has you driving in the mountain slash desert. There are a lot of twists and turns, and if you're someone who gets dizzy pretty easily, it's most likely not going to be your cup of tea. Now, before we actually got to the casino, there was something we wanted to check off our bucket list. We like to consider ourselves thrill seekers and we came up with the idea of parking at the side of the road and checking out these abandoned homes slash buildings. If you've ever driven to this casino, I'm 100% sure you've passed by them. In any case, it takes us a little bit longer than usual to get there, but at last we can see the buildings coming up. Brian puts on his hazards now and then proceeds to drive a little bit off the road where we currently were before he ends up parking. The sun was just setting at this point, which did create this perfect photo slash video opportunity as my friends and I began approaching the buildings. Each of these five buildings had a letter and a number spray painted on one of their outside walls. We still aren't quite sure what they indicated, but it could be that it had to do with a lot number. Brian now grabs the camera and begins recording as Philip and I act as these so-called urban explorer hosts. We talk about how we stumble upon these abandoned buildings and how we wanted to show the audience at home of our findings. We start heading into the first building and there's a bunch of graffiti on the walls. There were food wrappers, water bottles, and even some used syringes. We had to be careful where we stepped because one wrong move and we're tripping and then poking ourselves with those used syringes and needles. We didn't want that happening. Once we've gotten enough footage, it was now time to head to the second building, but here's when things take a turn for the downright worst. As soon as we entered this second building, we ended up hearing movement at one of the back corners. Brian shines the light of the camera toward that direction, and we see two people, males, crouched in the corner with glass pipes and some spoons and lighters. We apologized, and then for whatever reason, Brian asks the two what they were doing out here. 
One of the men tells us that we needed to leave and then reaches for something in the corner. We see he's got a hold of a knife and that's what sent us packing. Strangely enough, the two strangers didn't follow us all the way. They just stood watching from the broken down doorway of the second building and watched us until we left. We ended up making it to the casino about 30 minutes later and put the creepy experience behind our minds as we actually ended up coming out positive. I still have the footage we filmed, but it's pretty cringe hearing our acting. The footage does show the two men we encountered, which I guess is kind of interesting. Let me know if any of you want to see it. I guess I could post it if any of you are interested, but again, just let me know if that's something any of you would want to see. For the past few years, I've been working all the way up in Prudhoe Bay, Alaska. It is quite a distance from my home up in Anchorage, but for the couple of months I am employed up there, I do make quite a living, so it's not something that I really complain about. Work life up in Prudhoe Bay is quite uneventful, and the workers here are just like me. Ordinary citizens just trying to make their paychecks, then go home to see their families. Really, there's not much up here. That's why this experience doesn't take place up in Prudhoe Bay. However, it does occur on my road trip back home to Anchorage back in 2015. And what a road trip that is. It's gorgeous. All around you are mountains, frozen rivers and lakes, and the occasional wildlife you'll see at the side of the road. A couple of hours before I reached the city of Fairbanks, I started to grow pretty hungry and I wanted to stop and get a bite to eat. Luckily, I noticed signage for a small town that had a diner and once I'm there, I pull up into the parking lot and head inside. It was quite busy, all things considering. It reminded me best of those old diners you see in classic movies with its decorations and staff who always had a smile. I chose to sit next to this really nice old lady at the bar who said she always liked to sit here and drink her coffee and talk to the patrons. I soon learned why. She was very talkative, and when she recommended this steak and mashed potatoes for a big hungry man like me, I didn't question it. For the next hour, we're talking and eating as the diner starts to empty out and eventually the old lady says she's going to go home to feed her cats. So I wished her a good night as she soon walked away, and I took out my phone to check the time. It's almost 8pm. If I can get into my truck now, I should make it to Fairbanks a little after 10pm. Thus, I left my money and change on the countertop and wished the staff a good night as I now step into the cold October's evening. Here's when things were about to change. As I start to walk to my truck, I notice just a short distance away from me the old lady from the diner talking to this random stranger who's all bundled up. I wasn't going to pay too much attention until I saw the man reaching for the lady's purse. She was struggling to keep it away from him and I knew now this guy was up to no good. So I quickly run over just as the man steals the purse and I stop the guy just before he runs away. Sorry pal. But that doesn't belong to you, I said in an intimidating voice. Without saying a thing, the creep pulls out a knife and now tells me to back up or I was going to get stabbed. No way was that going to happen to me. If you're going to threaten me, I'm going to defend myself, no questions asked. I took out my concealed carry pistol while telling the man not to come any closer to either me or the old lady. I was surprised by what this guy does. He drops the purse and just takes off running. Well, to the best of his ability, as he actually did slip and I burst into laughter telling myself, huh, that's what you get for trying to steal from an old lady. Speaking of which, she thanked me profusely and I told her the last thing I let happen to her is get mugged or hurt. Now luckily karma wasn't finished just yet. At this same moment, out of all places and times, an Alaskan state trooper is pulling up into the diner parking lot. You bet he must have been really surprised seeing me, as at first he was asking me why I had my pistol out. I quickly was able to clarify what had just happened, and the officer decides to go after the would-be criminal. I decided to stick around to see if I would catch any of the action, but the only thing was that they talked to this random man, before placing him in the back of another cruiser. 
and eventually taking off. Well, at least the old lady was safe. Anyway, that was pretty much the whole experience. I got back into my truck, got to Fairbanks, slept, then continued my road trip back home to Anchorage without any further incidents. I live in Anchorage, Alaska and work at Ted Stevens International Airport for Alaskan Airlines. I have been here now for going seven years and it's very different from my life when I used to live in Fairbanks. That's where my family is originally from. Last Christmas, I was able to get a week off and decided to drive up to visit my family for the holiday. Now, anyone who might be familiar with the drive from Anchorage to Fairbanks, you know just how quiet and lonesome it gets. Once you leave the city, you're surrounded by endless mountains, fields, and trees that are blanketed with white powdery snow. It really is something I can't put into words. You need to see it for yourself, because it really feels like you're in a fairy tale book. Now, I was taking care of some chores at home as I'd be gone for a while, meaning I didn't get on the road until about 2 p.m. Accompanying me on this road trip is my adorable cat, Luna. That morning, it was about 5 degrees, but by the 5 o'clock, it was reaching minus 15 degrees. You couldn't be out for long before you started getting headaches and any exposed skin would start to burn. Not that it's really a concern, since Luna and I are sitting comfortably in the car with the heater on. Now, I'll save you the trouble and skip to what happened as most of what happens next is just me driving in the middle of nowhere with the last sign of humans being well over an hour ago. I ended up having to go pee after I drank most of the coffee from my thermos. Being female, stopping on the side of the road to use the restroom wasn't something I was really a big fan of. I had done it once before when driving to Seward. Trust me, it wasn't fun, but there's just something about being so vulnerable in the middle of nowhere that makes going potty that much more difficult. Well, luckily, I'd spotted a sign for a rest area in about 10 miles, and I was able to hold it until I got there. This rest stop was just a little cement building with one male and one female restroom. I saw no other vehicle, which alleviated some of the anxiety I had about being sneaked up upon. Anyway, I packed my 9mm Smith & Wesson and brought it with me as I slowly opened the female restroom again checking for any signs of activity. I left the car running by the way with Luna fast asleep in the back seat since I didn't want her getting sick or getting cold. Out here where I was it was about minus 20 degrees and sitting on the toilet seat was going to be impossible. I ended up having to get creative which I'll save you the embarrassing details. Not even 30 seconds later, yes it took me that long just to begin because of it being freezing. I hear a car tires crunching on snow. I start to think, did I forget to put the brakes on? And was my car rolling down the hill? That couldn't be. I just knew it. I was correct, however, because once the snow crunching gets closer to the building, I hear a car door open and then close. My nerves started to pick up and my heart is racing like crazy, thinking why of all places did somebody just have to conveniently show up? Well, what other choice do I have? I surely wasn't going to stay in this icebox, and I surely wasn't going to let paranoia stop me from leaving either. Therefore, I put on my big girl pants, kick the door out, and start walking over to my vehicle. Guess what? There's a truck parked right next to me, and sitting in the passenger seat is a man with a cigarette. Hi, good evening, the man says, as he opens his car door and steps out into the snow being illuminated by his headlights. Hello, I ushered back in a nervous tone, just a few feet away from my car door. Hang on, I just got here. What's a cutie like you doing out here in the middle of nowhere? The man responds as he walks over to me, blocking me from leaving. Just had to use the restroom. I got family waiting for me. Now if you don't mind, I really gotta get going. I try to step to his left, but he gets in my way yet again. Um, I think your family can wait. Want to spend a little time inside my truck? I promise it'll be fun. The smirk on his face said it all. This guy was looking to get lucky, if you know what I mean. Under normal circumstances, this 5'4", 115-pound female would have stood no chance against this behemoth, easily over 6 foot and approaching 300 pounds. 
Get out of the way, I'm warning you, I said as I take a few steps back, reaching into my back pocket. What are you going to do? He doesn't get to finish more of his sentence as I pull out my handgun. Whoa, okay, alright, calm down. I'm just messing around. No need to get so defensive. Get out of my way, and if I ever see you again, you'll be sorry. He doesn't say another word. He tucks his tail between his legs, so to speak, and then walks back into his truck. He now drives away, as Luna is hissing at the man and all the hair on her back is standing straight up. I quickly jumped into my vehicle, not only having a full-on panic attack, but freezing from being out there for so long. It was about two and a half minutes in total, but enough to cause a headache. After I was able to catch my breath, I made it to Fairbanks just before midnight, where I took a nice long hot shower and then slept until 2pm the next afternoon. I'm an older listener of yours, at the age of 60, who enjoys winding down after a long day of work and listening to scary stories. I really can't wait for the days when I can just unwind and do that all day, but alas I have another 6-7 to seven years to go until I can retire. With age has come a various amount of experiences and encounters that I oftentimes find myself sharing with family and friends. This is the first time I've decided to share this story with anyone, and I really hope you'll get a kick out of it. It was the summer of 1982, the year that I wanted to prove to myself that I can drive across the United States on my own. A friend at the time had done it himself, and he told me that through his adventure, he made many wonderful friends and everlasting memories. I wanted in, and at first I asked him if he would have wanted to join me. He was going to, however his wife had just given birth and he didn't want to be away from his family for too long. Well, I didn't want to wait until he would be free, who knows how long that would have taken. So with his advice and a roadmap of the US, I one day packed my things into my car and started to drive. I was living in Southern California by the way during this time of my life and the plan was to head to New York City. Now, instead of a straight shot, I took various different routes and highways so I could get the best of the states. Whichever states I missed on the way to New York, I would try to drive through them on the way back. Obviously, I could spend hours and hours talking about what I saw and experienced, as well as the nice families I stumbled into that actually let me stay at their homes, but that's going to make this submission never-ending. Instead, uh, let me focus on what my submission is all about. It was the return back home to California. I remember it being well over 100 degrees that day, and I had just entered northern Texas, wanting to take a break in the next major city I would be encountering. However, a problem soon arose that would then lead to some of the craziest moments of my life. My car had overheated. This meant I was essentially made to stop at the side of the road. As you know, cell phones were not available to the public back in the early 1980s, so the only way to get help would have been to get someone to help you. But would I have been so lucky? The heat sure wasn't helping my decision making. So I pretty much spent the next 10 minutes trying to see if there was something I could do to help get my car up and running again, while being on the lookout for some kind of person who might be able to help me. Luckily, help arrived in the form of an elderly man who quickly came to a stop and asked what had happened and if I needed a ride. I told him, yes, I did need a ride, and he says there's a gas station just a short distance away and he could take me there so I can get some help. I thought about his offer for a few seconds before telling myself, sure, why not? I could really use the assistance after all. I jump into the passenger seat and we take the next five or so minutes driving and talking. I recall how well we hit it off as he introduced himself as Phil, or something like that, and he started to tell me he was a World War II veteran and that he was on his way home from visiting his grandson. I told him about my trip and he thought it was a really cool idea and that it was a shame it had come to what it had. Fast forward to reaching the gas station and we both get out of the vehicle and head into the little convenience store. The man who drove me here said that he would keep me company until help arrived, 
and meanwhile if there was any food or snacks I wanted, it was his treat. A nice gesture that I took. Now as I was on the phone calling for roadside assistance, Phil had entered the restroom to do what he had to do. About a minute after I lost sight of Phil, I'm shocked at what I see next. Out of nowhere, I see an unmarked SUV pull up into the gas station. Seconds after, someone in a ski mask, holding a large hunting knife and wearing a backpack, jumps out of the passenger seat and runs up to me with a purpose. Hand over your wallet and whatever you have. I guess he wasn't that smart since the assistant on the other end of the phone call could hear everything, though at first he might have thought somebody was playing a prank on me. I chose not to hang up, instead putting the phone down and doing as this guy said. I quickly handed over my wallet, and I now started to back up with my hands up. The man then ran into the store, and I watched as he went over to the cashier and told the clerk to empty the register. Now, in case you're wondering, I did relay the information to the assistant on the phone, and he told me he would have cops sent to the area, but that it might be a while. It did make sense. At this point, you might be wondering, what about Phil, that old man who was in the restroom? Was he still in there? Well, he was, but not for long. You see, while I watched the robbery taking place, I saw Phil walking down the aisle from outside the window. But here's the thing. He's got a handgun. Where did it come from? As I soon learned, Phil was packing heat the entire time. I heard Phil tell the man to drop the knife, which was muffled by the window, and the front door being slightly opened, and I was surprised by the fact that the guy with the knife actually does what Phil said. He placed the knife and backpack on the countertop, put his hands up as told, and was instructed not to move or to try reaching for the knife, or he was a dead man. The cashier, seeing his opportunity, quickly grabbed the knife, and soon joined Phil. Now, I can keep going with this submission, but it's getting to be a tad too long. So basically, all you need to know is that the now unarmed criminal ran out of the store, got into his vehicle, and drove off, never to be seen again. I was left dumbfounded, and after standing there for a minute just lost in my own thoughts, Phil stepped me out of it and asked if I was okay, and if I wasn't injured. I assured him that I was fine, and I told him cops were actually already on their way and we could soon talk to them. Unfortunately, I don't know if they ever caught the guy. It has been a very long time. But if they did, hopefully justice was served. To the grandson of that nice man who picked me up that day, if your grandpa told you the story of a guy he picked up in northern Texas back in the early 1980s and who helped thwart an armed robbery, and you're just so happening to hear this story, then just know I am forever grateful for your grandfather. May he rest in peace, and may God bless your family. This was in the winter of 1998. For quick context, I'm male and I was 25. I was traveling in between Salt Lake City and Las Vegas so I could spend time with family. I was in Vegas, they were in Salt Lake City. So everything was going fine until I began to notice something quite strange. There was a Ford Explorer that had been following me since the rest area I had made a stop at about 10 minutes prior. The only reason I'd noticed it was because the man who was driving it kept getting too close for comfort. I thought maybe he was trying to get past me, so I moved to the other lane hoping that would be the end of it. Instead, he chooses to move over with me and still doesn't let up. Well, that's weird. So I look into the rearview mirror, but it's almost impossible to see him due to how dark the windows are. It also didn't help that it was around 10pm, so I couldn't see inside. This back and forth continues for another 5 minutes, until I make the dumb decision of confronting him. I now pull to the side of the road, which he then proceeds to do the same. Once I'm out, I flip him off, but this only causes him to exit his vehicle. The guy starts cursing and saying how I had just cut him off about an hour prior. Now, I'll be honest, I did sort of do that, but it was only because I was going to miss my turn. I wasn't sure why this guy was so upset, but apparently I had angered him to the point that he wanted to get violent. He reaches into his back passenger seat, 
and grabs a baseball bat of all things. He then begins charging toward me, but I manage to get back into my seat. And that's not before he shatters the driver's window and shards of glass fall everywhere. The glass ended up leaving some nasty marks on my arm, by the way. Now, before I could leave, he manages to connect with another window shattering it too. I pretty much book it, but I'm scared he would continue to follow me. He doesn't thankfully, but now I had to deal with my arm, which was stinging really badly because of the glass. Of course, you have to remember this was a time and age before cell phones, so I couldn't just call for help. Thus, I take an exit about 15 minutes later, where I head to a 24-7 convenience store. The cashier was nice, and he was able to patch me up with a first aid kit that they had, and we called police. Sadly, since it was so dark, I couldn't see the license plate, thus that jerk ended up getting away. So, that's your reminder to be careful when you're out on the road. Some people aren't exactly too friendly. Who else enjoys a little road trip? I sure hope it's not just me, because there's just something so peaceful about hopping into your car and heading out into the countryside where you're surrounded by miles of never-ending mountains and fields. Such was a time in 2016 when I took a road trip to visit my uncle John. I was driving from Huntington Beach, California with my pet bull Rex, keeping me company along the way. Nothing was really special about the trip other than I left my house at around 8pm. I would have left earlier in the day, but I had to cover a shift for a co-worker who had called out sick, which I'm pretty sure was a lie since it seemed it was starting to become a trend. Either way, I held no sort of grudge as the next five days were mine to spend time in the sun, go to the casinos, and swim in my uncle's pool. Well, let's not get too ahead of myself. I had to actually get there first, and of course something happened along the way that was very creepy. Just a while after I'd passed Barstow, California, I had a really bad urge to pee, which I blamed on the venti caramel frappuccino I'd purchased not too long before. I could have turned around and gone to Barstow, but that would have wasted time. Therefore, I held it in as I saw an advertisement for a rest area in less than 10 miles. Once I pulled off of the freeway, I quickly jump out of my car, run into the restroom, and do my thing. Also, before anyone says anything, don't worry, I had left the window down in the car so my dog Rex was able to get some fresh air. In fact, I left it all the way open, meaning if Rex really wanted to, he could jump outside. Not that he ever would since he's very well trained. Plus, remember, this is at night. So anyway, it just so happened in the three minutes of me being in the restroom, another vehicle had pulled up into the rest area which I didn't mention before, was empty other than just myself and Rex. I see this vehicle along with its occupants as soon as I step outside. I see a man who was standing next to his truck smoking a cigarette. I gave him a hello trying to be a good Samaritan and then he starts to approach me asking me if I was alone. I told him I was with my dog Rex and he seems to back off for a second but then he does something that I look back and think Wow, this guy must have really have been desperate. He jumps in front of me and asks if he could get my phone number. I guess that's all it takes for love at first sight, huh? I told him no and he gets visibly upset. I mean, what was he expecting? I push past him to open my driver's door and he then puts his hand on my shoulder. That was the last mistake he would ever make. Rex began to bark so loudly and so aggressively that the man actually takes a step back. I took one look at Rex as I opened my door and tell Rex, get him. The man got out of there so fast that I'm surprised he had enough time to jump back into his truck and get away from Rex. That wasn't without Rex scratching the paint on his truck and leaving him with a good scare. Anyway, I never saw that man again and I would hope he never tries to pick anyone up in the middle of nowhere again because you never know what they might have waiting in store for you. November of 2019 I had taken a road trip up to Lake Superior, Michigan to go and visit some relatives for the Thanksgiving vacation. Joining me on the road trip from my home in Georgia to Michigan was my cousin Sam who had come to visit me just a week prior. 
Now, I'm not going to waste any of your time talking about my vacation, but instead I want to focus on the way back home to an incident that truly left me at a loss of words. Now, I would like to consider myself an above average driver with a kind of person who could drive long distances and not really have to stop unless it was for gas, food, or to stop and use the restroom to take a break. However, on this trip back home, I ended up taking a few more breaks than usual due to me messing up my back while helping my uncle lift some coolers for a Thanksgiving dinner. It wasn't anything that I couldn't handle, and within a week of returning home, I was fine, but the inflammation and bothersome pain definitely extended what should have been an easy drive home by an extra couple of days. Anyway, I want to fast forward to an evening after I'd finished eating dinner at a McDonald's, which consisted of some chicken nuggets, french fries, and some Sprite. I'm in the middle of nowhere, Tennessee, at roughly 9pm, driving down the highway all by myself, and all the salt and sugar from a couple of hours earlier is starting to mix in my stomach. The gassy feeling from eating fast food is now becoming a problem, and the urge to stop and use the restroom was growing more and more into a reality. The issue was finding a place to take care of my business. If anyone has ever driven through the rural parts of Tennessee, you know finding a rest stop is quite the challenge. I remember taking a look at my Google Maps and saw there was a visitor center slash rest area in approximately 10 miles. Let's just say I may have or may have not went high above the speed limit because it was getting to the point where I couldn't take it anymore. Thankfully, I didn't bump into any highway patrol. I'll save you the disgusting details, but I arrived at said rest area and I was able to use the restroom in peace. But it's when I'm finished and about to head back to my car to continue my trip that things are about to take a turn for the downright terrifying. Now, I guess I sorta did just jump to me coming to use the restroom and I haven't really begun to describe the rest area which is actually kind of an important detail, so you get a general idea of just how lonely this place was. The so-called visitor center was completely abandoned. It looked as if a bulldozer had run over it and hadn't finished flattening it all out. As for light, the only light source you had came from this dingy little light bulb on top of the restrooms that was flickering on and off and appeared as if it was on its last leg, so to speak. Yeah, so not exactly a place you'd want to be at. Say, someone tried to mug you, right? Well, using my cell phone as a light source, I'm washing my hands and splashing a little cold water on my face to wash away the dirt and try to at least keep myself awake. And this is when I hear the sound of car tires on dirt approaching the building. The light from what appears to be a vehicle is also beginning to flood in through the crack of the walls. And I remember telling myself, why, of all times of night, did someone have to conveniently show up and join me? Whatever I thought, I was leaving. I exit the restroom, and as soon as I take a look over to my truck, that's parked just a matter of a few feet from the main entrance, I noticed a tall figure looking into my driver's side door. Hey, what's up, can I help you? I said in a firm, shaky voice, as the individual tried to pull at the door handle. This your car? Yeah, I said, this time with a bit more paranoia in my voice. Oh, it's very nice. Something about the way he spoke just felt wrong. It's like my sixth sense was telling me I needed to get out of here right now, because if I didn't, this man was going to bury me quite literally six feet under, and I was never going to be heard from ever again. Thanks, I hope you're having a good night. I'm just about to head back home myself and meet up with my wife. I ended up saying, still choosing not to approach the man nor my vehicle, as I don't even know if he might be armed with a weapon. Yes, I was that paranoid. Well, hey, you got any money on you? He says in a calming voice, completely changing his demeanor. No, I don't. Sorry, I wish I could help you out with that. What he does next was absolutely frightening. And to this day, I will never forget the next sequence of events. Don't lie to me. You have a wallet, and I want whatever's in there. Now hand it over. He barks back at me, as his mood returns to that of anger. 
I stood there frozen as from his back pocket he takes out a utility knife and begins to approach me. My heart was now racing out of my chest and I recall my brain sending all these signals throughout my body essentially saying you need to run or you're going to get stabbed. That's what I do finally realizing it's now life or death. Yes I could have just handed over my wallet but how was I to know that was all he was going to want to do? So what I do next was completely risky. With my back still in some pain, I sprint around him like a cheetah and pretty much in one quick motion, unlock the front door with my Bluetooth keys, throw my cell phone into the passenger seat and quickly lock the door just as he's a mere inches from my face. The man begins pounding on the window and tries to once again pull at the door handle but I pretty much left them in the dust. I think quite literally too. And I got back onto the highway, shaking and on the verge of crying, but just praying he wasn't going to follow me. Thank the heavens above he never did follow me, and I pretty much drove non-stop for the next three hours until I reached a more populated area with some gas stations and traffic. I never did bother to report the incident to anyone, which part of me sort of wishes I did. Needless to say, I made it back home in one piece, but with a memory so frightening that even to this day I will occasionally have nightmares of that evening. Nightmares in which the same man comes up to me, but in all those scenarios, I don't make it out alive. For context, this is from the perspective of a 26 year old female. This was in the spring of 2017. I was returning from a road trip in which I went to visit some family for my week off from school. They live in Montana and I was heading back to Southern California since I had moved out there just a year prior. Around Baker, California at approximately 2 in the morning, I was starting to run low on gas and I needed to make a quick pit stop at a gas station, otherwise I was going to be left at the side of the road. Now just picture it in your head when I say it's completely deserted at this time of the morning as I pulled up into a gas station tired and sore from sitting down from so many hours of driving. As I step out into the cold windy desert night pumping gas into my vehicle as the sounds of crickets chirped I notice some headlights drive up from the off ramp exit I'd arrived from and then watch as an SUV approaches my vehicle choosing to park just a few feet behind me. I rolled my eyes more so because I get annoyed when people have to be right next to me and looked into the front window out of curiosity. Sitting in both the driver's seat and the passenger seat were two large men, one with a beard and beanie and the other with long hair and reading glasses. I chose to ignore them as I finished pumping the gas and then I walked over to the convenience store so I could grab a couple of snacks. I am immediately greeted by a really nice cashier who wishes me a good morning then asks me if I wanted a free complimentary cup of coffee. I took him up on the offer but told him I was going to grab some cookies from down the sweets aisle before returning and paying for the meal. I was contemplating between Chips Ahoy or Oreos, honestly one of the hardest decisions when it comes to cookies, and suddenly I hear the same sound I had heard when I entered the little convenience store a couple of minutes prior. The audible sound of the front doorbell ringing. I looked toward the front out of curiosity and noticed it was the same two men who had parked behind me near the pumps. The cashier also greeted them. However, I recall they ignored them and just started to walk around and head toward the back where the beer is located. So far, nothing really out of the ordinary. Anyway, in that moment I ended up getting a text message from my mom who was asking me if I had made it back home yet or where I currently was. I go ahead and update her as well as tell her I'd be home in about an hour and as this is happening I couldn't help but hear faint whispering. Wait, not yet. And let's wait until we're outside, away from the cameras, is what I heard coming from the aisle next to me. A bit alarmed, I briskly returned to the front counter, looking back and seeing the men awkwardly looking the other way as we made eye contact. And here's when I mentioned what I had heard to the cashier. He takes what I said to heart and quickly grabs the gas station phone to call the police. 
Once he said he needed officers here in a loud and stern voice because of a disturbance, the two men quickly jolted out of the convenience store, not even choosing to purchase anything at all or making any sort of apology. They then hopped into their vehicle and drove off, never to be seen again. That essentially confirmed to both myself and the cashier that they may have been attempting to grab me when I least expected it, and who knows what they might have tried doing after that. That gives me nightmares even today as I'm sharing this with all of you. I really can't tell you how many stories I've heard since my experience in the news of similar reports of men trying to take women from either gas stations rest stops are the middle of nowhere. No less than 10 minutes pass and a police officer arrives to take both of our statements as well as to get some further insight to what had just occurred. I left soon after giving my statement and continued my way back home, a bit on the edge and paranoid, but relieved I'd overheard what the men had whispered because I truly believe they may have thought I hadn't heard them. Update. It's been years that this has occurred. And as far as I know, I'm not sure if the police ever did any sort of further investigation. There was nothing in the news, and I guess since technically they didn't actually do anything to me, they probably wrote it off as just a couple of creeps trying to give me a hard time. But what do all of you think? A big misunderstanding? Me being paranoid? Or something more sinister and dark? Leave it in the comments and I'll try to give you a response. This has been a long time coming, and I've been meaning to share one of my creepy stories for quite some time. Apologies for not getting back to you, but when you work at a grocery store full time as a manager, you almost never get a break to just sit down and write, or even read for that matter. So here I am. This was something that happened to me in the late 1990s, when I went on a road trip as a means to move on from an ex-girlfriend who had essentially dumped me where I would later learn she had been seeing my then best friend. It was rough, I'll admit, and as a young guy in his 20s, with nothing but the world ahead of him in college, my studies took a turn for the worst. I can still remember the semester I found out the heartbreaking news. I barely passed my classes, and if it wasn't for some extra credit opportunities, I may have had to have retaken some of those courses. But that's besides the point. It's just some information I wanted to share as a setup that leads to the road trip I just mentioned. Once that semester ended, my plan was to drive from my home in Southern California and head toward Las Vegas for a week where I had an uncle that still lives there to this day. Then once I had gotten my fill of the trip and the casinos, I had head toward Arizona and visit the Grand Canyon. Finally. After spending a couple of days doing some backpacking and photographing, I'd loop back around and head back home. Sounded like quite the plan, and it was pretty peaceful at first. Now, I'm not really going to focus on my time with my uncle since that was relatively uneventful. I'd say the only cool thing was we went on a helicopter tour around Vegas, which I still have a photo of somewhere. Anyway, when I was approaching the Grand Canyon, it was around 7 in the evening, and I had been looking for a place to stay at night. I tried a couple of hotels, but when I pulled up and walked up to the receptionist, they told me they were booked. A bit disappointed twice, I decided to just go grab some food, and then try again at another hotel. Luckily, third time was a charm, and I managed to get a hotel that was quite a bit of a ways from the Grand Canyon itself. But at least it was way cheaper than the others I tried going to. This hotel would be the location of one of my more creepier memories. It all started after I finished checking in and placed my baggage in my room. I recall taking a long hot shower and then laying down for about 30 minutes, surfing through the same 15 or so channels they had on offer. At about, I'd say 10 p.m., I had the urge to go for a smoke break, but I realized I left my cigarettes in the car. Now, I don't smoke anymore, thank goodness, but back then I had to at least go for one before I went to bed. It was my relaxation, if you will. So I went ahead and walked out of the hotel, still full of energy, and I make my way over to my parked vehicle in this comfortable 50 degree dark night. 
Now, this parking lot from my best recollection was not only very dark, the lights were almost non-existent apart from the starry sky, and a few lamps scattered across that parking lot, but it was very quiet too. You could hear the sounds of owls and the wind going through the trees, and even my footsteps echoed on the pavement. Well, I was standing next to my car, enjoying the peaceful evening, and a set of footsteps could be heard shuffling through the parking lot. At first, I didn't really mind them since I made the assumption somebody was just down for a walk, but after roughly 15 seconds of seeing no one, again it was hard to see anyway because of the lack of visibility, I began to grow quite paranoid. It's a very difficult emotion to describe in words. A lot of times when I hear the stories you narrate here on the Creepy Fox, people will mention similar feelings, myself included. I can agree in saying you can't really quite express it on paper, you have to experience it in person. So anyway, I'm still standing there having my smoke, like a complete moron, and just as the footsteps I was hearing grow louder and closer, a figure walks out from behind a couple of stationary vehicles. They were tall, scrawny, and it wasn't until they were just a few feet from where I stood, I got a better look at them. The man appeared disheveled. Long, greasy hair fell down to his shoulders. A stench like something I would best describe as rotten eggs entered my nostrils, and his clothing was tattered and ripped as if he had just gotten out of a fight with a wild lion. I began to grow nervous as I finished my cigarette, then proceed to lock my car, ready to head back to the hotel. All the while, this man is just standing there and staring at me. Nice evening we're having, right? The man said. He just continued to stand and stare at me as if he was speaking a completely different language. And all the while, his hands haven't left his coat pockets. Well, I hope you have a great rest of your night. Before I could finish my words, the man walks closer to me, blocking my exit, and practically within breathing distance. And then he tells me to hand over the keys to the car. I took a step back and tell him that wasn't going to happen, and what he does next forever sends shivers down my spine. In one quick motion he takes out a knife and tries to slash at my stomach. I don't recall if it was cat reflexes or just my sense of fear, but I ended up jumping back at literally the last second as he still managed to connect with my sweater, cutting off a bit of the fabric. I booked it back to the hotel as fast as I could that I don't think I've ever run as fast as that ever again. All the while, I looked back only to see the man begin to run in the complete opposite direction and disappearing into the tree line. By the time I made it into the hotel lobby, I practically gave a heart attack to one of the janitors who I remember was mopping the floor, and I'd tell him about the man in the parking lot who has a knife and even show him the slash in my sweater. Needless to say, the hotel goes on lockdown and the police were called as we pretty much kept a lookout for the man with the knife. He never did come back, and when police arrived, I remember they did a full search of the area with park rangers, including the parking lot, forest, etc., until the all clear was given. Now, I don't know if he was ever captured or brought to justice, but I do know for a fact I was seriously this close to being mugged and having my car stolen. Although, considering he tried to attack me with a knife, he already went into the mugging knowing full well it was going to take someone's vehicle, even if it meant by force. So friends, I can conclude by saying that being in any sort of fight or flight situation is no fun. Please, and I mean please, do your best never to fight back especially if the person you're facing is armed. It's better not to be a hero, and there's no shame in running away from the danger. Literally, no one will give you a tough time for it, and really shouldn't, to be honest. For reference, this comes from a female who at the time was 23 years old, and this takes place in Texas. In 2009, I took a road trip to visit family about four hours north of me, for the 4th of July holiday. At around the halfway mark, I was starting to get a bit hungry, so I stopped at a rest area with a subway, a McDonald's, and a gas station so I could grab myself a bite to eat. I was also going to take the opportunity to fill up on gas because why not? 
I picked up some chicken nuggets with fries and a coke, and after devouring my meal, I walked on over to the gas station and asked the lady employee to put $30 on pump number two. I took care of that pretty quickly, but as I take a seat, ready to once again commence my driving adventure, I'm getting the bad urge to go and pee. Darn me for having such a fast-acting digestive system. I walked back into the gas station and I quickly made my way past a nice family and into the hallway where the restrooms are located in. As I approach the women's restroom door, I start to get this really terrible smell of what I can best compare to as the smell of a roadkill skunk. It was definitely off-putting, but I entered disregarding the nasty odor. When I approached one of the stalls, the smell growing even more unbearable and a trail of smoke hovering up to the ceiling, a 40-something-year-old tall and skinny woman with really bad breakout acne on her face, black thin hair down to her hips, and wearing some clothing that looked as if it hadn't been washed in weeks, walks out with a handmade cigarette in her left hand that's lit at the tip. She now just stares at me with these really beady eyes, as she then exclaimed, You're a really beautiful woman. You seeing anyone right now? I was caught a bit off guard, so I just gave her a quick, Yes, I am, and this seems to satisfy her curiosity, as she now heads over to the sink, and I head on over to go and pee. Fast forward about 30 seconds, I open the door to the stall and there she is just standing right there, staring me down as if I was part of some long lost civilization. Sorry, but can I help you? Is everything okay? She walks over to me to the sink and then once again starts to tell me how beautiful I was and how I could make a lot of money if I joined her in her business scheme. She further stated that she had a friend who was a pimp and he could really make me a star and promised I would make a boatload of money, but that wasn't happening. I told her I had a well-paying job and I was living my best life, and when I turned my back toward her, I suddenly get a feeling of dread, almost as if my brain was telling me, you big idiot, why did you take your eyes off of her? What was in a matter of moments, she runs past me and then stops in front of the restroom door and says, I never gave you permission to leave, little lady. We're gonna have a little chat, so why don't you get comfortable and relax? There was nothing to relax to, as I start to explain to her my dad was waiting for me in the car, and he would be really angry if I continued to keep him waiting. I was hoping bringing my dad into the conversation would get her just to give up. But of course, wouldn't you know, she doesn't fall for it. She now starts to tell me to take my clothes off so she can take pictures of me to send over to her friend, the pimp, to which I tell her, again, that wasn't happening. Well, wouldn't you know, she takes out a small box cutter and then exclaims this was my last chance to get away unharmed. Here's something I have yet to mention, mostly because I didn't want to spoil it to you all. I carry a knife, and it was way larger and longer of a blade than the cheap little one she had that was in my purse. I finally take mine out after having my hand next to my purse opening the entire time, and finally having enough of her BS, I tell her that she needed to leave, otherwise I was going to defend myself with all the life energy that's inside of me if she got too close. Wouldn't you know she gives me a variation of the I wanna apologize line like the one popular GTA 5 clip of the NPC, and then she just storms out of the restroom. I quickly follow this crazy lady out, and I watch as she runs past some of the shoppers in the store, and out the front door, where I soon lose sight of her. The family, who I walked past a few minutes ago, now comes over to me and asks me if everything was alright, to which I told them the lady who just ran out was threatening me with a box cutter, and was saying she was going to stab me if I didn't get naked. They found it off-putting, as did the clerk, so much so that we ended up calling the cops for further assistance. I don't know whether or not they caught the lady, but I and some of the people there just gave our statements. I left a short time after being cleared, and I made it to my family's house, with absolutely no other problems. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, make sure to hit that like button and leave a comment telling me what you all thought. 
and subscribe and turn on notifications if you're brand new. Also, make sure to check out our song, Make a Start. You can find it on Apple Music, Spotify, or even here on YouTube. Go to my YouTube channel and check it out underneath the Creepy Fox topic section. Also, consider grabbing some Creepy Fox merchandise, which you can see right below the video. And if you want early access to brand new videos with no advertisements, as well as exclusive narration videos not available to anyone else, consider becoming a channel member. Which, speaking of, I'd like to go ahead and give them all a shout out. Thank you to Robbie, Bo, Spunky the Nutcase, Rice and Beans, Scott, Sean, Corey, Linz, Maribel, and our newest member, Medu Satel. Thank you also to the regular viewers who watch the uploads, like, comment, and share them with their family and friends. I appreciate and love every single one of you. Thanks once again for stopping by, and I'll catch you all on the next one. Take care, and have yourself an amazing day.